Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Peter. It's indeed a pleasure to be here uh, representing the evening service, and it's great to have our team here this morning. Um, I just want to say what an honor and a pleasure it is uh, when I have the opportunity to come and speak in the morning service. It's, uh, it's uh, something I've got to sit down because when I stand up, I feel like a preacher, and I'm not a preacher. I, I'm just here to kind of give you a message and a message of hope, hopefully. Uh, and this morning we're speaking about that still small voice that, uh, that we hear in our heads and our hearts as we move forward in our lives and in the mission work that we do. It's that still small voice that keeps us on the straight and narrow. It keeps us heading in the right direction. It keeps heading us in the places that we need to go as much as we can do it. If we're turning our will and our lives over to our higher power and we're following his directions, things seem to go the way he intends them to go. It directs us in our lives and in our missions and it keeps us, uh, I think, happy and in a place of serenity as we do that. In our scripture this week, Elijah was told to go to the mountain and to wait for the Lord. Many things happened and I think the demonstration that Mary did this morning was better than anything I could say that was awesome. Um, I, I couldn't even come up with those kind of ideas and she did a great job of it. But Elijah was told to go to the mountain. Uh, when he was there, a, straight, a, a, a great strong wind tore that mountain open. And Elijah looked for God and he couldn't find him. The Lord was not in the wind. After that, an earthquake hit and Elijah again looked to see if he could find the Lord and, and he wasn't there either. And the same happened when a fire came. He couldn't find the Lord. While Elijah was in the cave, he then heard the still small voice say to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So let's take a look at what was going on in Elijah's life. Like all of us, he had a lot of things, a lot of troubles happening. Elijah had just finished winning a huge war that he fought on behalf of the Lord against the prophets of Baal. However, because of, his, because of this, he was sentenced to death by, uh, by Queen Jezebel, and he was expected to be executed the very next day. So even with the great wind, there was still that threat, that fear, the uncertainty and the unknown things going on in his life. He was still going to die at the hand of the powerful and evil queen. You also have to read beforehand and in the answers that he gives the Lord each time he's asked him what he's doing there. Elijah not only had a huge price on his head, but he felt alone like many of us do from time to time and believed that he was the only one left to worship and, allowed, and, and follow the Lord and his commandments. When you look at how he responded to the angel of the Lord, these are all indications of his feelings. His feelings of fear, depression, loneliness, discouragement, and he just wanted to give up. He just wanted to go somewhere, roll over and die because he felt he wasn't accomplishing anything. All his efforts, were not getting him anywhere. Uh, like, what's the point of doing all of this hard work? If you've ever been depressed, or if you've ever just really down, if you've ever just sitting on the pity pot feeling sorry for yourself, and you don't want to do anything, there's nothing anybody can say or do that will encourage you or motivate you. Then you can understand how Elijah was feeling. So the only thing you find worth doing is sleeping, or isolating, or being by yourself, in a dark place, and maybe, like Elijah, hoping to die. Elijah did just that. He fell asleep and he hoped to die. Suddenly, he, um, an angel touched him and told him to get up, go and eat. So he did that, it didn't help, because he went back, laid down, and hoped to die. When we're going through struggles and trials with our current life and with the missions we're doing, or maybe our job, sometimes you want to ask the Lord for counsel about how to deal with it, how to get through it, what, what to expect next. Usually, the Lord, instead of maybe giving you that counsel, helps prepare you for your next mission in life and for your next lesson. After Elijah came to, came to the cave to lie down, the Lord came to him and asked again, what are you doing here, Elijah? God wasn't asking him really what he was doing in that cave because God had sent him there. He was wondering what he was doing in that headspace. God was talking about what Elijah was going through. Why are you here in this depression, in this state of not wanting to live and being hard on yourself? 
Elijah told him, he said, I've been zealous for the Lord. The Israelites have forsaken your covenant. They have thrown down the altar. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And they're now seeking my life. And I feel very much alone. We always think that we'll experience God in those mountaintops. When we go out to Kananaskis, when we go to Banff, we want to feel him. We do sometimes feel him there, but we expect a big bright light when we have our spiritual awakening. It doesn't always happen. Uh, there should be signs of great winds, earthquakes, mountains being split open and broken to pieces and fire. But God was showing Elijah that he wasn't necessarily in the chaos, but in the silence that he is currently in. It's like when we're feeling the most alone. That's when God is most present in the silence. When we're feeling alone, depressed, discouraged, down or afraid, we are never alone for God is with us in the peacefulness of the silence. Paul said that when he's at his weakest, that's when Christ is strongest in him. For instance, do you ever notice that when you're going through bad days, tough times and whatnot, sometimes you just need to take a deep breath. That's my counsel to many of my, and many of my drug court boys when they're really fussed up and whatnot. I say, just stop, take a deep breath, just relax, just think about it. And Kerry does the same with many of his guys, right? Just take a deep breath and it seems to change things, it silences things, it kind of silences our mind. We sit in a dark room or we go off by ourselves and sit in the presence of the Lord and we hear that still small voice. You're most focused on him and his care for you when you escape the chaos. So when you don't have all that crazy stuff going on, we can stop and we can focus on that. God's not in the chaos, he's in the silence. And when you turn to him in the silence, he'll help you realize that you're not alone either in the chaos. So long answer short, God was showing Elijah that he's not always in the big mountaintop experiences but also in the silence. Elijah was feeling alone, depressed, afraid, worthless, and like uh, he was, what he was doing was of no point. God was saying, meet me there and I'll meet you in silence. This scripture and Elijah's experience reminds me so much, so much of our experiences in our addiction. The feelings of depression, discouragement, being down, afraid, being alone, are very common before people come into recovery and for a long time after they start the recovery journey. I have personally uh, been guided by that still small, small voice on many occasions, but the one that's so obvious and the one that, that had a, a spiritual experience with me was the one I've talked about often in this service and in the evening service. But I'm going to repeat it again because it's so true and it, it happens so easily. Um, about 10 years ago, I, I had just, uh, just started doing AA meetings at CYOC. And uh, I was out working at that time. I was doing uh, sales, business to business in the community. I'd been having a particularly bad day. I'd had some sales counsel. Some that I thought were going to go ahead didn't. And I was sitting on the pity pot. I was just like Elijah. I was feeling sorry for myself. I was wondering about my efforts. They weren't getting me anywhere. Um, and I was wanted to go home. I wanted to go back to Bicycle, be with Cheryl and just sit on the Chesterfield and do nothing and feel sorry for myself. It was my day to go to the, the AA meeting at CYOC. So one side of my brain was telling me and helping me make all kinds of excuses and reasons why I shouldn't go and conjuring up good lies that I'd be able to tell people to justify my not showing up. The other side of my brain, that still small voice was telling me, Peter, you made a commitment. You need to go to that meeting. You need to be there. There's boys there that otherwise will be locked in their cells all night and they won't have a chance to get out. So the struggle went on pretty much all afternoon, but the still small voice won out. And I went that night to the AA meeting. I went uh, and sat up in the library and as the boys were coming in, I was greeting them and watching them. The last young man that came through the door was about 16 years old. He was obviously in withdrawal. He's what we call in the program itchy, bitchy, and twitchy. And he didn't want to be there very badly. He wanted to be out of his cell, but he wasn't interested in being there. When it came his turn to speak, as we went around the table, he looked at me and he said, Peter, I can't stand the thought of living my life sober. So this is pretty drastic for a 16-year-old boy. During the meeting, our eyes kind of met one another. There seemed to be some kind of a connection. And at the close of the meeting, he came up to me and he said, 
is there any chance that you could stay for a few minutes and have, have a visit? And I said, of course, that's why I'm here. He kind of looked at me funny at that point in time. Uh, we went to visits and he started telling me a story, a story of hardship, of growing up, his family issues. Uh, he had been in and out of jail many times prior to this. He was a very angry young man, uh, remembering that he was only about 16 years old at this time. He was telling me a story and his anger was flaring and he was getting angrier and angrier, but he was telling me I stopped him, told him to take a deep breath, just relax. And then I asked him, I said, do you have any faith, Adam? And he said to me, he said, I don't know. And that was the best answer I could have heard at that point in time uh, because it wasn't no. He left the door. Remember, I'm a salesman, and the door was open just a little bit. I was able to stick my foot in there and shove it open just a bit further. Um, he went on with his story, and, and it didn't get any better. And finally, I said, Adam, have you ever tried to pray? And he looked at me kind of funny. He said, yeah. He said, I have. In fact, he said, last night when I was brought back into CYLC, I was taken on the unit and thrown in my cell. He said, I got on my knees and I prayed that God would send somebody here to talk to me. He looked at me and he said, ask me that other question. So I said, do you have any faith? He said, yes, I believe, I believe in God. And you know, that young man never went back to jail after he finished that sentence. He hasn't been totally clean and sober <laughs> the, whole, the whole time, but he's had long periods of sobriety. And today I chatted with him yesterday, actually, he's in Salmon Arm, BC, working and, and very, very happy. He's been in our life for uh, the last 10 years and uh, has been in the life of this church off and on, got baptized in this church. There's a couple of reasons that I tell that story is because there was that still small voice. It took me a while to realize what it was, what was going on, but that was, I believe, God telling me I needed to be there. I needed to, to meet my commitments that I had done, but there was somebody there that needed to see me. Um, Adam is typical of the young men and young women that come into this church in the evening service. He comes here. Adam came here because he, he needed to have his spiritual self filled. He needed to feel loved and cared for. He needed that love to be unconditional because he hadn't experienced that before in his life. Our evening service is one of unconditional love. We accept everyone just where they are on their spiritual journey or on their life's journey and we pass no judgment. I, just another quick story um, on Pastor Wayne's retirement evening in the evening service of a year and a half ago. A man came to that service, he's come every week since, and he came to that service and before the service he came up to me and he said, uh, do you guys pass judgment on people that come out of jail? And at the time I didn't want to open my mouth because on the tip of my tongue was, so take a look around here, about half these people are out of jail, right? <laughs> Uh, I didn't want to say that. I said, no, we, we, have no, we don't care about your past. What we're worried about is your future and helping you get to where you want to be and to be the man you want to be. That's all we're worried about. He had served a little bit of time in Spy Hill and went back to his original church and they kicked him out. They said, you're not welcome here because of what you've done. You are cast out. I and we pride ourselves on the fact that we accept everybody. It doesn't matter where they are, who they are, what... What uh, oh, we have many, well not many, but we have a few uh, Muslims that come in the evening service because they love the message, they love the music, they love what's out there. So we speak every week, for those of you that haven't been there, on the 12 steps. And amazingly enough, we suddenly realized years ago that there was 12 months and there was 12 steps. So we start in January with step one and we go on through to step 12 in December. And all of the steps that are in the 12 step programs come directly out of the Bible. So we try to relate in the evening service in the message where, when we're dealing with whatever step, where it comes out of the Bible. The rest, um, the only step, actually the only step that has anything to do with addiction is step one of the 12 steps. And we generally talk about alcohol or, or drugs, but for those of you that don't have an alcohol or drug problem, we might have a, a work problem, we might have a relationship problem, we might have an eating problem, we might have a sex problem, we might have many other problems that come up. And if we can put that particular issue into the first step and say, you know what, I, I admit I'm powerless over whatever it is and my life is becoming unmanageable, then you can likely use the steps to change your life. The other 11 steps are all just how to live your life. Um, 
they're kind of broken into three categories. I'm not going into each one of them, but, but three categories. So the, the first three steps are what we call the foundation steps. So they're admitting we have a problem. It's trying to find a higher power. When we find that higher power, we'd like to turn our will and our life over to that higher power. The next steps from four to nine are what we call the housekeeping steps. So that's where we make a, a moral inventory of ourselves. We list all the wrongs we've done, the people we've hurt. We then give a, uh, we then talk about them to another human being and to God. I call it a spiritual puke, actually. Um, and from that, we'll recognize some of our defects of character. And we start working on those defects of character. And then we'll make a list of people that we've hurt and people that we need and should make amends to. Then we make amends. And that's kind of our housekeeping step. And then the last three steps, 10, 11, and 12, are what we call our maintenance steps. And so that's step 10, which is October, what we're working on right now, is really looking each and every day at how your day was. Did you offend anybody? Do you owe anybody an apology? Do you, do you need to make amends to anybody as you go through your day? And if we're able to do that on a daily basis, then we don't have any baggage to carry with us from day to day or to worry about in future days. So if I've offended somebody and we make amends, then we can move forward with it, right? 11 is getting closer to God, uh, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. I listened to Pastor Wayne say that in every prayer for years. And one night a light bulb came on and said, my God, I should, I should maybe do that and, and, and put that into my, into my prayers in my life. And shortly after I started doing that, I was guided into the remand center, into the CYOC, into the drug court and whatnot. He was telling me what he wanted me to do and, and started guiding me in those directions. So uh, yeah, step 12. Uh, is is uh, doing 12-step work, is take, carrying the message out to people who are still struggling, who are still suffering in the community. But it's more than that. It's doing service work. It's giving back to our communities. It's giving back to our recovery community, but maybe it's giving back to our church. It's giving back to uh, our, the Boy Scouts or youth groups or whatever have it. It's getting out and getting out of ourselves. We also carry the message into hospitals, into jails, into schools, and we talk to people about addiction and people with addiction to try to sow a sense of hope. This church has had a mission for the homeless and for the addic addicted for years. Pastor Wayne uh, started the recovery ministry here what, 25 or 30 years ago with Pastor Michael's blessing and support, and it has grown each and every year since then. This has always been a safe place for people to come to, no matter where they are on their spiritual journey, to experience God's radical, relentless, and unconditional love for each of them. We have the honor to minister to the broken, to the hurting, to the hopeless. For one hour Sunday night, they might see some hope. They might start to heal a little bit from their hurts or we might say something, or Mary and Guy might sing a song that'll give them a sense of hope so they can go away with a little lighter feeling at the end of the night. We're here as a refuge for many people, a place that they know that they can return to after a long absence and they'll still be welcome. We have witnessed many people start on the recovery journey at Central and as they get, maybe get better in their life and maybe they want a little bit more, they drift away, but they often come back. We've had people come back after nine or 10 years and say, this is home. This is what I consider to be home. Central has a reputation all over this city and I think the province as the recovery church. I also think that maybe as I think back on, on the last number of years, like right across the country, it has a reputation as being the recovery church. We hear God's still small voice calling us to our mission and guiding us in our work. He brings people to us and brings us to them. So just before I wrap up here, I want to do a little commercial interlude um, about next Sunday night in the evening service. And next Sunday night is our nothing short of a miracle. We have six amazing people who have dramatically changed their lives, lives from living on the street, maybe drug dealing on the street, from being in and out of jail to being productive members of society. Uh, and we want you to come and hear that message. We're trying to change the face of addiction. We're trying to 
let people see that addicts are one thing when they're an addict, but they are real human beings with real faces, with real jobs, giving back to society in, in a great way once they get clean and sober. So I invite you, it starts at six. It's also birthday night, so we will have birthday cake there to, uh, to enjoy after. So come please, fill the sanctuary up next Sunday night for nothing short of a miracle. Support these people uh, and it will be a great joyous night. I want to thank you all for giving the evening service the opportunity to come here this morning. I want to thank Bill and Shannon and Carrie for being here and taking part and helping out. And um, just thank you and God bless.